Leslie is one of my favorite entrepreneurs at the moment because at MIT Technology Review, we like people who solve big problems and creating a sustainable, safe, cheaper form of energy for the 21st century couldn't be bigger. That's the civilizational challenge of our time. And it's going to require a whole variety of solutions, including reviving a 50-year-old reactor design that we didn't build for bad reasons, but which has the potential to change the world in the future. So, with our annual 10 Breakthrough Technologies list, we identify areas of innovation that seem to us poised to have significant impact. One of the technologies we identified this last year in 2014 was the arrival of smart wind and solar power. What this means is that at the moment, though solar and wind have enormous potential, they're intermittent, which means what it says. Uh, the sun doesn't shine the whole time and the wind doesn't blow. And adding intermittent power to the grid is problematical. You have to keep all sorts of backup generators going in case the wind and the sun fail, because we can't do storage at the moment. Until we can solve grid-level energy storage, the only real solution to making wind and solar a larger contributor to the grid is to have more efficient energy uh, and to have some predictive modeling. So our last speaker of the day is Rich Capusta, the chief marketing officer at one of our favorite photovoltaic companies, Auto Devices, where they are developing solar panels so thin that they can be placed onto your phone screen to power it without the need for wires and which can potentially make grid-level storage also more efficient. So, Rich, welcome to the MTech stage. <clears throat> Thank you, Jason. Okay, so uh, it's getting really close to the end. I now empathize for how Sumit felt yesterday, being between you guys and cocktails. I see a lot of thirsty faces out there, so I'll try to keep this going. So I'm going to talk about power, obviously. Um, power, uh, we just talked about how important it is and how uh, there's still a lot of challenges to be solved. and yet. For some, to some extent, we definitely take it for granted. You know, there's plugs everywhere around. Um, and yet, you know, there are still a lot of parts of the world that don't have reliable access to power. So here are a couple stats. You know, in Nigeria, 56 million people live without access to electricity. Interestingly enough, 90% of the population there has access to cell phone connectivity, um, but they have no power. Uh, and you notice the world is definitely going more and more mobile. Uh, you can see the difference from 2013 to 2014 in how people access the internet, especially look at Asia and Africa, you know, huge explosion in moving more and more mobile. I was talking to Sid from Disney yesterday uh, at the cocktail hour, and he gave me an interesting stat that 90% of new internet connections in India are all mobile. They're all coming from either phones or tablets. So as our kids grow up, you know, they, they won't know what a desktop or a laptop computer are. Everything will be accessed through mobile devices. So somehow we have to power all those things. And obviously solar is a great, uh, a great way to do that. It's clean. It's renewable. Um, it's one of the many ways that we need to continue working on to provide power to the world. Um, and yet, even today, solar power is largely grid connected. So the solar panels that I have on my house, they work great, but you know, they're still tied to that plug. Um, so as soon as you move away from the grid and you run out of power, you know, what happens? You get stranded or you get stuck. And so how many people yesterday experienced this phenomenon, right? By the end of the day, your phone is dead. You're looking for some place to plug it in. Uh, I know I was at dinner with Jason. He's looking for a plug in the, the back corner of the restaurant. Um, so power is great, but when you're not close to it, 
um, it's still quite a problem. So, you know, what if there was a technology that provided power on the go, essentially? And that's really what we're trying to do. And then the last element to power that we don't often think about is batteries. Um, today, I'm sure in your house, you must have dozens of things that are battery powered. You, know, you forget about them until those batteries die, and then you got to go change the batteries, and then you throw the batteries away, and then you're back up and running again. And as we heard uh, over the last couple days, the world is becoming smarter. And to be smarter, there are a lot of sensors that will create all of that intelligence. You know, Steve Leonard yesterday talked about a smart city having lots of different sensors that collect data of all types. But he said an interesting comment. He said, in order to truly be smart, or for a city to truly be smart, it has to be connected 100% of the time. So you can't lose connectivity. What happens if you lose power? So to stay connected, you have to stay on. You have to stay charged. So that's another element to you know, being able to have a power source that you can take with you. So that's what we're doing at Alta Devices. So we've developed a solar technology um, that is ultimately thin and flexible and highly efficient. So in order to be truly mobile, it has to be something you can carry around with you. So I don't know if you guys can see this real well, but this is our solar cell. It's obviously super thin, super flexible. It's small, uh, but it can be connected together to create larger sheets. Um, and the other interesting uh, characteristic of that particular solar cell is that it works really well in all kinds of light. So it's not necessarily only for sunlight. Um, it can work off of ambient light. Here you see, you know, obviously, these lights are pretty bright. But if you, if you go to the back of the room, you would see these LEDs still shining from the light that's just available in this conference room. So that's another key element to being able to provide power more throughout the day, so you're not tied to just outdoor installations. So I like Leslie's term, sciency. Let's get a little sciency now um, and talk about how do solar cells really work. So I'm not going to get super sciency. This is going to be like sciency light. Um, so a photon would come in from the sun and since I just talked about indoor light, it doesn't really matter where the photon comes from. So any photon will strike the surface of a solar cell. And essentially, what that does is it excites an electron. And that electron moves into the conduction band and creates an electron-hole pair. And that electron-hole pair then gets collected by the front and back metal of the cell, and that's turned into electricity. So the, fundamentally, all solar cells work the same way. But the material that you choose to make that solar cell out of obviously determines many things. Besides just the pure efficiency of the solar cell, it determines the thickness, the flexibility, the voltage that comes out of it, uh, the temperature performance characteristics, the environmental uh, characteristics of the cell itself. So all these things vary depending on what the material choice that you make. So looking at major solar cell technologies, they range from you know, a couple of percent efficiency all the way up to almost 30 percent efficiency. And what do I mean by efficiency? It's really just a, a pure ratio of how many photons are coming in versus how many electrons are coming out. So I'm not going to go over every single one of these, but if you look at the sort of landscape of solar cell technologies that are out there, you have everything from organic cells, amorphous silicon, SIGs, CADTEL, silicon, et cetera. The ones on the left side of this chart are the ones that tend to be flexible. But as you can tell, they also tend to be lower in efficiency. And the ones that are to the right of the chart are the ones that are commonly found today on rooftops and whatnot. They tend to be the, your higher efficiency variety, but they're rigid and thick and heavy. So really what we needed to do is to figure out a way to combine both of those key characteristics. And that's what Alta Devices was founded to do, to create a solar cell that has both the efficiency, which we hold the world record for, 
at 28.8%, but also have the thin and lightweight and flexible form factor. So how do we do it? So first and foremost, we picked a different material. So gallium arsenide is what we use to make our solar cells. It's been used for solar applications for decades. It's what drives most of the space applications out there today. Um, so it's, it's been known to be a really good solar material for, for many, many years. It's also really expensive um, and brittle and thick and heavy. So our invention, our IP, is all about how do you make it thin and flexible and in the end use as little of it as possible so that we can control our costs better. So to walk through kind of the, the, the manufacturing flow in a super simple sort of animated way, what we do is we start with a wafer, uh, literally a square piece of gallium arsenide that we repurchase off the shelf. And we put that into what's called a reactor and using a process called MOCVD, which is metal organic chemical vapor deposition, we start growing layers onto that wafer. And so we'll grow a number of layers uh, on top of that gallium arsenide. There's one in particular that's quite special. It's aluminum arsenide. It's that yellow layer you see there. It's special because from a crystalline perspective, it's exactly the same as gallium arsenide. That's the beauty about three fives, is that you can grow crystals and mix up what the materials are. Um, and it's also special because it has different properties when it comes to etching. So when we take this sandwich of all these different layers and put it into a hydrofluoric acid bath, it etches away at that aluminum arsenide layer and leaves everything else behind. And what that allows us to do is to basically separate everything above it from what was below it. And that means that wafer that's really expensive doesn't get used. It actually gets reused in our manufacturing process over and over and over again. And so what ends up being the solar cell is just the part that we grew on top of that wafer. And it essentially looks something like this. This is a partially completed solar cell. It's got gallium arsenide on one side, copper on the back. It's got nothing on the front yet, uh, but this is the size and the basic feel of the material as it comes off of that wafer. So then what we do is we finish the actual solar cell by putting front metal on. We cut it up into individual cells. Uh, we can make these cells any size. Today we choose to cut this up into 10 pieces. And then we can stitch these cells together into really any form factor that you might need. So you can make them lightweight and flexible. You can make them into strips. You can make them into larger arrays that might be able to get curved onto a surface of, of whatever it is you're trying to, to put this onto. So it gives us a tremendous amount of, of capability uh, for putting this material onto anything that moves or can be carried or worn or, f or flown um, and essentially creates a mobile power solution. So let's talk about our timeline for a little bit. So we were founded a long time ago. We are quite an old company now. Uh, we're seven years old. We were founded in 2008. Uh, it took us about three years to get to the point where we could make a solar cell that captured the world record. And then in 2012 and in 2013, we were honored to be named one of MIT Technology Review's top 50 disruptive companies. And then in 2014, we were acquired by a company called Hanergy, who incidentally was named one of the top 50 smartest companies last year. I'd like to think we had something to do with that. Um, so now we're part of Hanergy, and our focus to go forward is essentially to commercialize and scale the technology to really get the, the, the the benefits of lower cost and, and more volume production. So you might ask, where are we going to put all this stuff? Well, the first example is UAVs. So we talked about drones earlier at this conference. Um, by 2020, you know, my number is small. I was thinking we'd have tens of thousands of drones flying. Um, the person from DJI said, we'll have millions of drones in the air. That's OK, too. Uh, all of these drones are battery powered and can certainly benefit from longer flight times. And that's a big market opportunity for us. If you look at wearables, another big one where you know, today it's, it's quite small, but within a few years there'll be hundreds of millions of 
fitness trackers and GPS locators and smartwatches and all of those things have batteries and they're really annoying to have to charge them every day. So if we can make those batteries last longer, that would be quite a benefit. Moving on from there, by 2020, a billion cars will be on the road. Um, some of those might be electric, some of those might be self-driven, but majority of them won't be. Um, they'll be regular cars. And you might wonder, why would you put a solar panel on an internal combustion engine vehicle? Well, there are some benefits of, of driving some of the subsystems within the car, but it's also being driven by incentives that the governments are putting in place. So the CAFE standards keep ratcheting it up the average miles per gallon targets, and there is a credit that they can get, uh, the manufacturers can get, by putting solar panels on the roofs of those cars. So there's a, uh, an, an incentive system that's being put in place that'll drive a lot of that adoption. And we talked about mobile devices. Certainly there's going to be 10 billion phones and tablets out there that all can benefit from a little bit more battery life. And then sensors. You know, there's many estimates out there, but you know, some people are throwing out the, the T number for how many sensors will be deployed uh, within a few short years. Many of those will also be battery powered, and you'd hate to be throwing away that many batteries every year. So we have to do something to keep those sensors powered up uh, without polluting the world. So if you take all of that and put the appropriate amount of solar on every single one of those things, it adds up to 350 gigawatts of solar that would be needed to power, or at least offset the power needed for these types of devices. So that's a really big opportunity for us, um, and that's something that, that we're definitely focused on. So you know, we're trying to empower the unplugged world, and I should have used the blue marble planet. Unfortunately, I didn't. Um, and I hate to say it, but yes, we believe our future is very bright uh, at Alta Devices. And uh, that's all I have. Thanks for your time.